Hey everyone, so this is going to be a quick reminder on how decision boundaries work. We previously discussed this uh, back in probably lecture three or four, but this time I want to add some context and give you a bit more of an intuition on this. So we're going to get into the math right now. As previously stated, the way we represent a decision boundary is that we talk about the vector normal to the surface. Why is that? Because a decision boundary isn't just like, oh, we could use this as the vector to tell us where the boundary is. The problem with that approach is that it doesn't tell you which side's positive class, okay? So we don't wanna do that. We wanna use this vector because it both uniquely determines where the boundary is and it also says, hey, positive class is over there, and negative class is over there. All right, so uh, in general, W is the line normal. We usually talk about W uh, in a unit vector way, where we just normalize the length of it, and we're only using it as a directional pointer. Okay, so how would we calculate that? Well, if we knew the slope of the decision boundary, then we can solve explicitly for that vector. We know that this guy here has got to be pointing at minus one as the y component, sorry, as the x component, because one is the positive component over here, but this one is pointing in the negative direction, right? because it's normal. So there's no, it's not always a negative one. It depends upon like where the line is. Obviously, in this case, that would be a positive one if it was using the same slope, but pointed that way, okay? But just look and see if the, the run on the rise over run thing is one. If the unit vector is pointed in the other way, just throw a negative sign on it like we did there. Okay, 1.2 is clearly the y component, the, the rise and the rise over run, right? And, well, if you take those things together, 1 squared plus 1.2 squared, that's going to equal to 2.44. And so that's how we know to normalize the vector by the square root of that, because Pythagoras says so. And that's how we get to a unit vector. Okay. So the other thing that you want to know is that when we have some test data point, x, and we want to know how far away is it from the decision boundary, we can use the dot product, right? The projection of this vector x that's over here onto this vector tells us the distance from perpendicular distance to that line. What we're saying is place a point, find the perpendicular distance to the line. Well, that's just going to be the dot product, which can be written either as a dot product or in matrix notation as W transpose X. So if we have our data point being over here, well, that perpendicular distance is going to be the dot product. And importantly, when we project onto that line, right? Remember what we're doing here is we're like, we're dropping a bomb down on here, and this is going to be the projection. Well, that distance is going to be bigger than zero anytime we're on the positive class side of things. And that projection is going to be onto the negative vector, and therefore it's going to be less than zero at those moments when we are on the negative class side of the decision boundary. Okay? So that's it. That's how we know both what class we're in, is checking if it's greater than zero or less than zero, and if we want to know particularly how far we are away from the decision boundary, just dot product any x data points vector onto that, um, that, that normal vector on the decision boundary.
w dot x is our distance off the line. Okay. Um, it's important to note that the reason why negative is negative is because dot products can be broken down into the normal, the, the magnitude of vector w, the magnitude of vector x multiplied by each other, multiplied by the cosine, and when that angle, right, between those things gets, when that angle is less than 90 degrees, then we're definitely going to be positive. And when that angle is greater than 90 degrees, that's when we know we're going to be in the negative territory because cosine yo. All right. So, yeah, it looks like I had stuff all there that I just overwrote, but whatever. So, pop quiz. Here we have a normal vector. We have a situation where we say, hey, we're going to be positive class if wx, w transpose x, w dot x, if it's greater than zero, otherwise negative class. Okay, this is just standard. But if I tell you this formulation, could my decision boundary be where it's drawn? Maybe my tone of voice tells you the answer. I'll let you work on it for six more seconds. So, yes, no, what do you think? The answer is no. Why? Well, it turns out, actually, that what you need here, there we go, what you need here is an intercept. What we're lacking is the ability to take that line off of the origin. Okay? This setup is actually going to have a w vector like that. What we really need is we need a plus b here in order to have a movement away from the origin. Okay, so in general this is the picture for decision boundaries. Then remember that the definition of a decision boundary is this. Every single possible x vector such that the dot product plus a bias term equals zero. Okay, so if we have our w vector, which is going to be in the same vector space as our x vectors, right? They got to live in the same vector space. We've got a bias term, which is a single real number. Then this place right here is the exact location where this is equal to zero because we know that stuff over here is going to be greater than zero and stuff down here is going to be less than zero. Okay, so the positive area is every place that it's greater than zero. The negative area is every place that it's going to be less than zero. Okay. And here's my w vector sitting here at the origin. w vectors are inherently from the origin. b is the shift away from the origin. Okay? So b is a shift in the opposite direction from the weight vector. Positive b moves the decision boundary under the origin. Negative b shifts the decision boundary above the origin. Okay, so when we have some new data point x, we can get the projection of x onto the w vector to get both which side of the decision boundary it's on and also how far away it is from the actual decision boundary. So note this, right? Look at the fact that we have this distance, that's the projection onto the w vector, 
But that doesn't take us all the way to the decision boundary. We have to add B to it. Remember, Wx plus B has got to be greater than zero. So that's why a positive B is a downward shift, because we're adding B onto this. Okay. So that's the entire thing. So when B is greater than zero, the decision boundary is moved opposite the direction of W, or in the case where W is pointing in the upwards end of the quadrants, then it's going to be shifting it under the origin. Okay, I should, I should have not have said that B shifts it under the origin, because that's only when W is pointed upwards. Okay, What B really does is it shifts the decision boundary in the opposite direction of W. So if W is pointed up, it shifts it down. But if W is pointed down, shifting opposite W will move the decision boundary upwards. So just think of it as opposite W, right? That's the main deal. So when B is negative, it shifts the decision boundary in the same direction as W. Okay, so just to run through a couple of typical examples, when we've got a W vector that is pointed straight up, okay, and B is zero, we have this situation that you're seeing in front of us. Okay, you can solve for this explicitly. We know that zero times x1 plus one times x2 is gonna yield us an x2 component that is exactly zero. Okay? So, what if we have a bias term? Well, if we have a bias term, then we know that the positive area is going to be only x2 minus 2 when we shift in the same direction as the, as the weight vector, right? We shifted the decision boundary along the direction of the weight vector. That means it has to be a negative bias. So x2 minus 2 is equal to 0 now. Okay? So again, you can show that explicitly with a bias of minus 2, that x2 minus 2 has got to be equal to 0 is the point of the decision boundary. Okay, so we could show a more uh, complicated example. So, whoops, oh, this is just the horizontal version of that same thing. In the horizontal version, the decision boundary is now just at minus x1 equals 0, right? I mean, you can see that graphically, okay? So minus x1 greater than 0 is going to be positive area, right? Because we just, just any time you have one of the vector components being 0 on the weight, it's easy. Okay, and we can also have the bias shifted version of this. In this case, we have a positive 2 bias, Positive 2 bias means we're going backwards away from that w vector. So now we have minus x1 plus that 2 is where we define the positive area. Okay, once again, we can solve explicitly for where the decision boundary is. It's at minus x1 plus 2. Every x component that every x2 component that lies at that x1 component is the decision boundary. Okay, here's where I thought I was getting to with the next slide, which is a more complicated situation, I guess, in that the weight vector now has is not just purely horizontal or purely uh, vertical. We have a minus 1 comma 1. So we've got both of these terms to design the decision boundary. So the decision boundary is where minus 1 weight times 1 weight on the x1 and x2 components equals 0. So obviously you can just throw out those 1s and just be minus x1 plus x2 equals 0. That defines a line, 
right here with slope of 1, as we know. Okay, that's where there's no bias. The decision boundary goes through the origin. But if we defined a negative 1 bias, a bias that moves the decision boundary in the same direction as the weight vector, the y-intercept is now going to be minus 1. Sorry, it's now going to be 1. Um, and that means that the decision boundary equation now looks like minus x1 plus x2 minus 1. Okay. So, the decision boundary is a hyperplane defined by the w vector. Without any bias, that hyperplane's got to move straight through the origin. If you define a non-zero bias, then a positive bias moves you forward. Uh, oh, sorry, moves you backwards against the w vector in the opposite direction, and a negative bias moves you forward. Okay? So you can just generalize this to higher dimensionality, where it's a hyperplane, it all still works. Okay, so this is the picture you want to keep in your head, especially when you're doing homeworks, for instance, that look at, hey, where is the decision boundary given this W and this bias? Okay, think that's good enough for this. I hope you found that useful. Talk to you later. Bye.